George Herbert is one of the more curious and convoluted of the metaphysical poets. He, uh, his work was enormously popular throughout the 17th century as a, uh, an example of Christian piety, quite frankly. And, uh, and to this day, some of his curiosities of his shape poems, especially, uh, remain uh, very popular favorites in the public mind. But uh, there is a great uh, tendency among his readers to simplify his work and just say, oh, well, he did that. He did the shape poems, and that's really cute and gimmicky. But that, uh, that, under, that uh, betrays him in several significant respects for the real subtlety and richness of his work. Uh, he lived from 1593 to 1633, died uh, supposedly of consumption at 39 years old. He had lived most of his life with an illness of sorts, not uncommon in, uh, in that era. And so his work has a real sense of suffering within it, something with which he was deeply and unfortunately familiar. Uh, he was a, uh, an Anglican priest. He trained at Cambridge. Uh, he was from a wealthy family, politically, artistically, and musically uh, inclined uh, family. He served a uh, term in Parliament during the very final year of James I's reign. And he was a very stolid member of the establishment then. He, uh, he was a... Uh, a, uh, a significant supporter of the monarchy and specifically the, uh, the Anglican church and the Anglican structure. And he, uh, as a poet, he, uh, he debated and dwelt on these issues. Pretty much all of his poetry we have from one publication uh, published at his death in 1633 in a book called The Temple, Sacred Poems and Ejaculations, and the uh, and pri Sacred Poems and Private Ejaculations. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, the curiosity of this work is significant. The, uh, the, the form and content and the way he deals with these uh, is remarkable and uh, in many ways quite unique and would serve as a great example to later very uh, equally complicated and rich po uh, poets like Gerald Manley Hopkins. Probably one of the most, uh, well, the thing that he gets tagged with, the thing that really stands out of, uh, with him among his contemporaries is his use of the so-called shape poems, where typographically the, uh, the, uh, the, the poems would take on a particular shape, uh, whether they are an angel's wings or, uh, or a cross, uh, the poems would be laid out uh, in print in this book as, as whatever, it, in the shape of whatever it is, uh, whatever it is discussing of its, uh, of its object. Um, and one of the, the more significant ones there is known as the altar, uh, it is the title. And it's, uh, it is thus in the shape of an altar. A broken altar, Lord, thy servant rears, made of a heart and cemented with tears, whose parts are as they thy hand did frame, no workman's tool hath touched the same. A heart alone is a, such a stone, as nothing but thy power doth cut. Wherefore each part of thy hard heart meets in this frame to praise thy name. That if I chance to hold my peace, these stones to praise thee may not cease. Oh, let thy blessed sacrifice be mine, and sacrifice this altar to be thine. And you can see there the, the, the shape and how it, the lines themselves alternate between 
um, a kind of uh, pentameter and tetrameter um, line length uh, to form the, the the base and the desk or whatever of the uh, of the altar. Uh, and and it's curious and it looks interesting on the page and so he tends to really pop in anthologies because people will be flipping through and see line 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 and then suddenly it's like a little picture and that itself is curious because he is in a way appealing to an aesthetic sense in his audience knowing that uh, it is going to be uh, uh, dramatic, that it's going to be uh, sensual in a way, and uh, that, uh, that he is speaking in a visual language that is uh, less text-based than let's say the uh the 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 pure tenets of the calvinist uh or the calvinist wing at least of the protestant revolution would accept but the uh it has deeper theological references as well uh the typographical arrangement is interesting but you can also think of this in terms of the typological where the figural reading of the relationship between two elements is the real matter of the poem. And here it is the material and the immaterial, the altar and what it represents. And here the poem itself is about that, uh, that relationship, the relationship of the human heart to the altar. And here in the poem, uh, a, a heart is made of stone, uh, and that is part of the altar. And the suggestion that a human heart is part of the altar suggests that it is part of the devotion of God, but still it is stone, which is curious. Uh, is a stony heart a sign that it is impervious to God or just that it is the weighted um, dead uh, materiality of human life in contrast to God? Is it, uh, it where does that relationship between God and man and the function of worship lie? The idea that you can sacrifice your stony heart is uh, complicated. How does one sacrifice something that is dead? Uh, the, the altar is constructed from the stony heart, and the stony heart is a sacrifice. But is it a sacrifice to give up something that is of so little worth. The, uh, the idea of the broken heart is uh, very rich in its uh, associations, and, the, uh, and especially in a theological and Christian context. Uh, almost the focus on it leads ultimately uh, to, in, uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, more down a Catholic vein, into the Mariology, into the focus on the heart of Jesus, the physical, fleshly uh, um, element of Christ. And the, uh, the, the critics have traced the concern in this poem specifically to uh, Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So the stony heart then is all that humanity can offer. The stony heart is all that uh, humanity can manifest to God and it is an act of faith that God will appreciate and accept this uh, this offering oh let thy blessed sacrifice be mine thy blessed sacrifice here presumably is uh, the sacrifice of Jesus and 
by offering up your stony heart, you are wishing to take part in uh, in in the crucifixion. You are wishing uh, in, in an imitation of uh, of Christ uh, way to experience that unification with divinity, and it is a plea in that end line uh, and sacrifice this altar to be thine which is the foundation of the altar i think significantly the in the interplay of form and content is very significant here and sanctify this altar to be thine is the foundation of the altar and it is a plea to god to recognize the uh the sacrifice to recognize the humble offering of the stony heart but also of this poem this poem that takes the shape of a altar this human construction of material worldly uh stuff is then all we have to offer and that offer isn't necessarily uh, confirmed in its receipt. Uh, we can offer it up, but the foundation of this altar is then an act of faith because it is not one that we can understand in this world to have any resonance in the other. And this problem of, uh, of this problem of unreciprocated devotion, unreciprocated um, love, quite frankly, is uh, runs throughout. Well, George Herbert's work certainly, but most Christian, uh, most Christian uh, um, poetry and art of this kind, the. Uh, noticeably throughout this it is not a kind of it, it, it there is not as much desperation there is a faith undergirding all of this work most of herbert's work has this sense of um wonderment of awe of, of it rather than the um ecstasy of let's say uh, more uh, I don't want to say uh, specifically Catholic um, poets but certainly of that uh, spiritualist vein that is a kind of overwhelming um, irrationality there's something very calm and Stayed is a loaded term, but it, it has some valiance here uh, for uh, for the faith, for the belief. There is a belief and a faith that all we can do ultimately is offer up our stony hearts to God. And it's up to the individual, I would say, up to the individual readers and worshipers to wrestle with whether or not that um, that ultimately uh, strikes home with God. It ultimately has an effect. The uh, <clears throat> the curiosity of uh, of his work is uh is i would say pretty uh pretty significant beyond uh the the shape poems uh but he is always very concerned with form there is a uh, a formality uh a materiality to his work that is um significant look at church monuments uh a fairly simple four stanza poem 
but with some interesting uh, some interesting formal uh, elements within that. It has an A B C A B C rhyme scheme that keeps up throughout uh, the uh, the dust the dust trust rhyme in the first and third stanzas uh, are are repeated, and then in the fourth and final stanza, it becomes dust and lust, which is interesting, that relationship between trust and lust. We can go down that road uh, uh, for quite a while. Uh, there are very few end stop lines, so it gives it uh, it gives this poem a kind of herky-jerky quality. There's an unevenness about it that is disturbing and awkward. <laughs> And uh, the, the stanzas themselves uh, are in jam. The stanzas themselves uh, trace from one line starting and then completing in the next stanza. Now, the original manuscript form of this poem uh, did not have the poem divided into stanzas, but the ABC ABC for, uh, uh, rhyme scheme pretty much divides that in. So dividing it into stanzas explicitly, typographically, gives that, uh, gives more, makes that element of it just all the more prominent, all the more conspicuous, let's say. The formal construction of the poem is more conspicuous then. And the, uh, the word dust itself appears eight times within this poem, including the adjective form dusty, which is a recurrent element within it that just keeps popping up. And that division between the body and uh, soul of this poetic speaker uh, becomes all the more conspicuous then, because this is a... Um, this is a uh, a poem expressing a kind of disdain for the body, a kind of uh, wish to discard the body. And let's remember, Herbert was very sick for most of his life, so kind of like uh, John Keats in later uh, in later England, he would be wishing perhaps to leave the body behind, to let his soul soar. And here it is uh, a, a conspicuous thread running throughout. Let's take a look. While that my soul repairs to her devotion, here I entomb my flesh that it betimes may take acquaintance of this heap of dust to which the blast of death's incessant motion, fed with the exhalation of our crimes, drives at last. Therefore I gladly trust my body to this school that it may learn to spell his elements and find his birth. Written in dusty heraldry and lines, which dissolution sure doth best discern, comparing dust with dust and earth with earth, these laugh at jet and marble, put for signs to sever the good fellowship of dust and spoil the meeting. What shall point out them when they shall bow and kneel and fall down flat to kiss these heaps which now they have in trust? Dear flesh, while I pray, learn here thy stem and true descent, that when thou shalt grow fat and wanton in thy cravings, thou mayest know that flesh is but the glass which holds the dust that, measured all, that measures all our time, which also shall be crumbled into dust. Mark here below how tame these ashes are, how free from lust, that thou mayest fit thyself against thy fall. So the curiosity here is, uh, I think, well beyond the words themselves. The form and content of the uh, of the poem are are oddly interchanged because we are considering this conspicuous patterning of the uh, of the poem, the ABC ABC rhyme scheme, and uh, and and that recurrence of the word dust and the weird enjambments and and stanza breaks, it is a fitful poem. It is a curious awkwardness to it that reminds you that form itself, 
that materiality itself is awkward, quite frankly, is an ill fit for the soul. And as you go from line to line, and it's always a little awkward when you're reading it, and sometimes when I'm reading it, I, I find myself wanting to fall into a simple and stopped uh, uh, line reading and I'm looking for the rhythm and I'm looking for the finality and that is very hard to come by. Form itself is hampered, is limited and you want to break free of it which is the content of the poem beyond the form. It is about the soul yearning to break free or at least the soul yearning to leave the body behind, to consign it to uh, a school, uh, which is a curious conceit, metaphysical conceit. The uh, leaving the body behind is to leave it in school, to bury it perhaps, is to leave it in school, a school that will teach it its, uh, its lineage and its heraldry to um, limit it into a strictly worldly material frame of an institution. A school is an institution, not, not unlike Cambridge, let's say, but also an institution is the church. And the line between church and school in Cambridge is kind of blurry. So the relationship of the individual to the institution here is, I would say, problematic and a little bit uncharacteristic. But the form of the poem, again, is driving towards that concern with outward form. And we perhaps are meant to, in this poem, the poem is suggesting, that we consider the form of the institution, the form of the church, the form of the liturgy of the Anglican uh, tradition. And all of these questions are being raised, but again, no, no real um, conclusions drawn, no real answers found. Um, we are left only with that rather harrowing image of dust running out like in an hourglass, and the hourglass itself will be crumbled into dust. Everything material, even time, and remember, God is eternal, working on a very different time frame, even time itself will dissolve. The notion of absolute destruction of all human concerns into a divine realm is quite harrowing, perhaps, for some, quite enticing, perhaps, for others. Certainly someone, I would say, who sees the body as doing him no favors, as something that he wish he could shuffle off. This poem, I think, explores that very explicitly. Denial, another one of his uh, more curious formal constructions, uh, with a curious, I would say, curious metaphysical conceit, which is a spiritual crisis as a kind of writer's block, where as a poet he is having difficulty or experiencing a kind of spiritual emptiness as a poetic emptiness. He is having trouble writing and composing his, uh, his devotions. His, the poems are, in, in a sense, devotions. In composing his devotions uh, to God, he feels empty. And that comes across in the form, which again works to unsettle the uh the um uh, to, to unsettle the reader to unsettle the easy reading of this poem when my devotions could not pierce thy silent ears then was my heart broken as was my verse my breast was full of fears and disorder my bent thoughts like a brittle bow did fly asunder each took his way some would to pleasures go, some to the wars and thunder of alarms. 
as good go anywhere, they say, as to benumb both knees and heart in crying night and day. Come, come, my God, oh, come, but no hearing. Oh, that thou shouldst give dust a tongue to cry to thee, and then not, not hear it crying. All day long my heart was in my knee, but no hearing. Therefore my soul lay out of sight, untuned, unstrung, my feeble spirit unable to look right, like a nipped blossom hung, discontented. O oh, cheer and tune my heartless breast, defer no time, that so thy favors, granting my request, they and my mind may chime and mend my rhyme. So you can see in that uh, the form, the, uh, the final line of each of those stanzas is just a little ragged. It doesn't rhyme. It, the, the meter is a little herky-jerky all the way until the end where finally it rhymes. You get the chime rhyme rhyme and very conspicuous the final word is rhyme and, uh, and, and it does rhyme so that reflects on itself. But also it is a still imperfect line I would say because it is, the, the meter is a little off it doesn't quite feel it doesn't quite feel regular and so it's a little bit better that the rhyme now works but that itself is making all the more conspicuous the fact that it is still an awkward um experience of the poem through the meter and again, you get the, the, the reference defer no time, that, that reference to time. Again, if we consider that, of course, God is working on a different time scale. God is eternal, um, so time does not exist. You have to look at the whole poem as existing at the same time. So the awkwardness of the non-rhyme exists in parallel with, rather than in sequence with, the final rhyme. So the final rhyme does exist in the beginning as well uh, uh, of the poem, in the beginning of the poem, but it's just one element. And it is, so you get that sense of, well, all right, all, so much of this does not rhyme, but there is always that element of rhyme there. But that just makes it all the more conspicuous that it's not throughout, that it's not a fully, uh, it's not a fully amended rhyme. It just existed in time as well. It is part and parcel of the imperfection. The moment of quasi-perfection exists concurrently with the imperfection. It is all built into a timeless frame that way. And the uh, the curiosity, I would say, takes uh, takes so many different levels. Uh, the, the, there is a pleading in the middle of this where the poems themselves, awkward as they are, speak back to the poet. As good as go anywhere, they say, as to benumb both knees and heart by in crying night and day, come, come, my Lord, O come, but no hearing. And then that no hearing line, but no hearing, ends the next stanza as well. So again, that curiosity of crying to God, but hearing no answer, but no confirmation, no confirmed receipt of that. And that uncertainty leaves, up to, leaves it up to the individual reader to uh, exercise his faith in believing that the message has gotten through, or let's say leaves it up to him to feel uncertain and be in doubt and have that crisis. And that's what this poem is all about, that crisis of being denied a response by God. In a way, it is. Uh, it, it harkens back to the, uh, the the story of Job, uh, where 
Job is demanding an answer of God, but there God responds. And, uh, but it is also significantly, um, uh, I would say, an analog to uh, the, the passion of Christ when he's being crucified. And in the, the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, have him saying, you know, God, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Demanding some response. And there is no response to be had here. Uh, therefore my soul lay out of sight, untuned, unstrung. The soul is a musical instrument, the musical, uh, musical instrument being an element of poetry, and I'll remind everybody that uh, Herbert was from a musical tradition in his family. Uh, untuned, unstrung, my feeble spirit unable to look right. Like a nipped blossom hung discontented. My soul is discontented. I am not content with the response I am getting from God. O oh, cheer and tune my heartless breast, defer no time, so that thy favors granting my request, they and my mind may chime and mend my rhyme. So in the end, perhaps uh god has inspired a rhyme at the end but it is a small rhyme a imperfect rhyme or is that a sign of the soul grasping its own way through poetic expression through devotion through worship and coming up with a humble cracked altar perhaps a stony heart. Uh, the uh, this raises the question as to whether or not God has any element in that at all. Does God respond to prayers on that personal basis? Does God bother to mend a rhyme in a poem? Uh, or to inspire a poet. All of this is for, uh, for theological consideration, but that's what Herbert is doing. Herbert is working out these complex theological problems in verse. Uh, he is a priest as much as a poet, and the, uh, the problems of one are the problems of other for him, and so you have to read his poems in that vein where the form and the content, the soul and the, and the body, the spirit of God and the flesh of man are all part of the same problem. Uh, the form of the poem is the body of man and the content of the poem, let's say, is the spirit of man. And the convolutions of that relationship, the connection and the disconnection of that relationship is all over the matter of his poetry. The form is always very conspicuous. The conspicuousness uh, it could be read as irony or, uh, or resignation. It, do we, uh, are we meant to consider the form of the poem as a uh, as an end stop line or an enjambed line uh, are we meant to consider it a roadblock or a landmark in our journey to God in the soul's journey to God the form is what we have it is ultimately all that we have the visible material nature bound earth bound reality of life that we try, we probe, we try and see the works of God, the hand of God within, but because of our human limitations, that is always fractured, that is always limited. We see through the glass darkly. We are ultimately weighed down by our humanity in our straining attempt to find God.